Okay. Um, go ahead and start the select board meeting for July 6, 2021. Um, 7 o'clock. Uh, first, other businesses to approve the agenda unless there's any changes. Um, just, I'd like to add a brief discussion on the, um, what do we call it there? The, uh, CD fiber, the, you know, fiber optics or whatever. The, Any particular spot you want to put that? Uh, anywhere under select board stuff. If you buy it. I will add it as G. <coughs> it's CB as in boy. CV. CV. CV fiber. Yeah. And that's all one word, Yep. Okay. Um, and can we add an item to approve the minutes of the June uh, 21st uh, session where uh, well, we can discuss that during the consent agenda? You can just add it under consent? Mm -hmm. Consent, yes. What should I say? Basically, the minutes should indicate who attended, that the meeting was held, and what purpose the board training and that no actions were taken. Yeah, I, I drafted those today. I forgot to do it timely. Okay. okay. I know on bills it was like an extra thing. All right. Um, with those changes, does anyone want to make a motion? I make a motion to approve the agenda Is there as second? amended. Second. Great. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Consent agenda items, minutes from June 7th meeting and the addition of the minutes from June 21st. So, could we just make a, uh, could I make a, a amendment to the, that the June 21st. This meeting is being recorded. I just Thank remember you. to turn on. That the um, meeting, uh, the training was attended by all five members of the select board. Uh, the uh, town manager, Bill Shepluck, and the town clerk, uh, Carla Lawrence. And the purpose of the board training was uh, to discuss um, issues of inclusion, diversity, et cetera. And we didn't take any action. Thank you. Um, anything else on the consent agenda items? Take a motion. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda items. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Uh, we are on to public, which I think it's 703. Um, we allow five minutes for the public to speak on any item that is not currently on the agenda. Um, if we could limit discussion to two minutes a person in case we have more than one person, that would be great. Anyone hoping to speak this evening? All right, we will move on to our next item. Can we go right to Conservation Commission even if we're early? Yep. Okay, we'll go ahead and start there. Come on down. Present. What's the... Uh, I'd go to that mic, maybe. Yeah. We'll just make sure it's on. Yeah, so the mic... Check, check. The mic is really for the people in this room kind of talk toward the owl here. That's where people there will be able to hear you. And that's for Ann. That's for Ann. That's for Walker. My name is Alan Thompson, Chair of the Conservation Commission. Appreciate you guys giving me some time today. Tracy Sweeney's in the audience, and Billy Vigdor, and perhaps others are also in attendance here. I just wanted to give our group a chance to introduce ourselves and introduce what we've been working on the last time we spoke, which has probably been over a year from now. Um, I th the, the strongest concerns that we've had and we've been dealing with over the last two years and even longer has just been land use and land fragmentation. The greatest initiative that we've been dealing with is Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor and our the Waterbury Conservation Commission's partnership 
and partnering with other organizations to help bring the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor to the general public has been, continues to be a good success, rather dormant over the last year, but um, at the end of 2019 and early 2020, we had successfully helped to conserve and have easements donated on a few hundred acres worth of property over four properties. And with the partnership, which includes Waterbury Conservation Commission, Stowe Conservation Commission, Vermont Land Trust, Nature Conservancy, Vermont Fish and Wildlife, um, and Stowe Land Trust as the primary leaders, we are reinitiating some planning phases to help kick off another kind of round of priority projects. Our role in that is really engaging in educational offerings. We had hosted many public events prior to 2020, um, three or four a year, and that was mainly our role in, in organizing those projects. Um, we had also, this last year, worked to create and draft zoning regulations for to be considered for the zoning rewrite, and those included more specific recommendations for the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor. Though currently those are in the hands of the Planning Commission for consideration, but we hope that the Planning Commission and subsequently the Select Board in town will consider the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor as an important place for wildlife and to use as a framework to think about land connectivity within the town. Wildlife can be a kind of synonymous with our own use of the landscape where bear and deer and moose have a place to roam. Those same spaces are used by recreationalists and hunters and loggers and foresters. Um, and so we, we have been using the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor because of its strength and popularity as a way to think about land fragmentation for the last few years. This year, I'm sure you're aware that um, real estate has, real estate transactions have been um, different and, and new to us all. Prices are high and there's been a lot of land sales that have been going on. I, I don't, we haven't necessarily seen that subdivisions have been a result of the, the land transactions, but when land sells high, price in order to recoup that price, land subdivision is going to be quick to follow. Over the last year, we've seen a lot of folks kind of reinvest their time outdoors. Boating and hiking and hunting have really, really increased, and the Conservation Commission has heard from a lot of, of Waterbury residents with their concern about um, kind of the, the state of, of Waterbury's land resources and the availability of the use of, of our wild spaces. Um, similarly, Waterbury land owners who have increased interest in things like their own recreation or carbon storage and climate change are um, thinking, a l I'd say, more proactively than we've seen in the past in their interest for conserving their own land. And so we, we even in this last year, have been receiving many calls, or not many, but you know, five to ten emails or phone calls with Alan or Deer Conservation Commission, I want to conserve my land, what are the options? And we, as a municipal organization, don't have a lot of direct resources to offer landowners, but we have kind of networking and, and sharing of, of information. And so we, we help those landowners um, guide a process, give them phone numbers and contacts. A lot of town forest questions. Can, can Waterbury have a town forest? Can my property be a town forest? Um, that, that continues to be a, of interest for Waterbury residents, especially from those who seek additional recreational offerings. Other land-related um, interests are the Hope Davy disc golf issue that, that I'm sure you've heard about. We've, we've been 
a, a little bit on the back seat in our involvement with that. The recreational com recreation committee is seeking our involvement in that, and we're I personally am having a hard time figuring out how best that how, how to navigate that situation because the organization is, is um, a little new to me and probably new to everybody here. Who has a responsibility to do what? To identify environmental concerns, we've been asked to do by the recreational committee, but not really knowing what the purpose of that park is has been a difficult place for our conservation commission to decide how to evaluate environmental issues when we don't necessarily say, well, we also want this space to serve XXXX. So maybe this is a message to encourage the select board to think about creating a little bit of a more of an organized structure around Hope Davy to help help with that, help facilitate who has the authority to do what and to control who. We're involved in water quality testing of uh, Thatcher Brook and Winooski River as part of Friends of, Friends of the Winooski River to test essentially for the impacts of road salt in our waterways. No um, results yet, but it's speaking from personal experience. It's kind of a marine environment on on the roads at times, and and salt is a can cause some serious environmental issues for our waterways and, and downstream habitats. I doubt that has kind of townwide interest, but the conservation commission is is thinking about road salt in our on our roads. Our education interests continue to be focused around land fragmentation and land use and land health. Um, invasive plants have long been an interest of ours, keeping our public engaged about how to keep the, our forests healthy or our farm fields healthy and invasive plants out of those spaces where possible. Um, I, think, I think that's a good summary of our activities to date and, and using those as general themes for what we're hoping to do in the future. We have a full, almost a full commission um, with a few open seats with one new board member uh, this year, which is great. We've, had, we've kind of maintained a strong presence over the last few years. Always welcome for more and certainly more input and certainly available to help think through complex issues that includes environmental issues, natural resource issues. Our mandate is rather widespread. It includes cultural and recreational issues as well. But our work to date has mainly been focused on natural resources. But we're here to serve. And um, if you have any requests of us, we'll be happy to entertain them. Questions? Being, being a former commission member, I don't have a lot of, I just want to commend you guys. I think it's good and really healthy that the commission is kind of turned over. You know, it, for a while it was getting a little, little stale, which is always, you know, it's a healthy thing, turnover, you get new, new perspectives. I think it's really good. I, I like Mike Hedges article about invasive uh, in the local newspaper. I think that was really important. And I think we're trying to do our part with the new mowing, you know, that may help a little bit with some of the invasives. And I know I support, you know, you know, all of your activities. So I do a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, yeah, I have a couple questions. One, the two properties sitting there next to the fish and game club that's had a full sale for forever. That's part of the corridor, right? What, what is the story with that parcel? Um, maybe we could. Is that an offline? No. Well, I don't know anything about it. Privately owned, huh. uh, 20 acres. When this, you know, when any real estate sign goes up, I generally take notice um, and it's been there for a while. Why that hasn't turned over, yeah. I'm not sure. It's a nice piece of property, um, but it is part of the corridor. It's part of our 
So the, the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor is essentially a 10,000 acre box, state land on the east and west, and, and kind of um, developed land on north and south. And within that 10,000 acre box are tendrils of connected forests that we've considered priority corridor areas. And within those corridor areas, we've decided that is, is where investments can be spent. That's where we're targeting our land conservation education efforts and hopefully being using those areas in our uh, zoning, uh, zoning regulations. And that parcel is, and the Fish and Game Club and the energy mill area, those wetlands and that forest is a part of that priority corridor within the Shootsville Hill corridor. And then Mike mentioned the mower. I guess my question is, how do we work with the commission? I'm sure there's already work being done, but what is that route of un identifying an invasive species like that knotweed, and then understanding a strategy and utilizing the equipment that we can help provide and work? And how does that all play out, typically? Um, one way to do it is that uh, Vermont a and has training for municipal crews on, on identifying and managing invasive plants. So the select board can mandate or recommend that the town highway department sends employees to those trainings. Another way to do it is once informed about what invasive plants are is to mow. In the case of roadside invasive plants, we only have, we can only manage a right of way, so it's not you know, you can mow the right away, and there's still going to be plants sure. right off of it. Um, being aware of flowering times and mowing times is is really important. The mowing, you know, when, when the mower idea came up, we were thinking mainly about um, wild chervil and wild parsnip along Little River Road and preventing that spread up the road. Mowing before those go to seed is essentially the, the task. And nobody except the town highway department is going to be able to schedule themselves and their mowing timing when to do Little River Road and others. And other places will flower differently. So they have to be aware of it and put it in their back pocket as, as to help them schedule their own mowing. And I know that was discussed because we were just leasing it previously and we couldn't time the flowering. Right. So we have, we own the machine now. We have moved up our mowing considerably. We used to rent it in the middle of the summer and a lot of those plants had already flowered before right. we mowed. Uh, we're mowing at least twice now. Um, and we're trying to mow for those particular species. And you're right, I mean, we've got a 50-foot right-of-way, and of that 50-foot right-of-way, we're mowing, you know, maybe six feet or eight feet on, on each side of the shoulder. That's as far as it extends. And I think part of the idea with that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is just preventing those plants from going to seed because they're right along the road. They tend to be able to be carried with equipment and vehicles and people even walking there so getting those seeds uh, before they go to seed has been important but as Alan just said I mean outside our right away you can see it on uh, Newland Flats in particular there's a lot of uh, the travel there and we mow our roadside but that whole field below the road is pretty much full of that thing so right and the pla some places it's really important to do it in that kind of first or second week of May, which is, in the case of other vegetation, it's a very early time to mow. It's not a very productive time for vegetation and will necessitate a second, at least a second mow yeah. to kind of just create line of sight and safe road travel. So we've mowed, most of the roadsides have had a double pass now that to, to mow down these invasives, gone through, um, you know, it's not, it's more efficient to go with the mower and just mow the width of the mower head and just keep going as opposed to stopping and extending it out. So we go through and mow right next to the road and then a couple weeks later, you know, we get through the circuit and come around and then mow the 
the next swath outside of that. And we've done that for these early mowing. And, and you know, from the perspective of maintaining a roadway, you don't want trees or shrubs and things like that growing up. So we, last year I think we mowed again later in the year, but um, we, we've got that scheduled. So we're doing what we can right now. Municipal crews related to invasive plants affect uh, also affect the spread of invasive plants through moving earth, right. fixing fixing ditches, and even kind of spreading early winter sand, especially. The both of our sand piles have the sand pile behind the train tracks and the sand pile in Winery Center have a, a tr nice. tremendous amount of invasive plants, especially the Winery Center one coming up the sides. And if that sand goes into a truck and goes in on the road, we'll have Phragmites the next growing season. And the Phragmites in particular is a, an extremely detrimental plant to have in both a kind of a, a, a natural ecosystem, but also a, a kind of a land use environment. If, it get, if that gets into your hay field and you hope to grow grass or anything, that you, it's, you're done. Um, and it's no accident that most of the Phragmites that's in town is within a very close radius of that sand pile. And it probably was brought there because that Phragmites was in the source pit that where we got that sand in the first place. But so being aware of how the stuff moves is, is one of the first parts of, of all that. And I think that Alec had done a really good job of fixing that sand pile, and that pile, because it was really close to the water for a while, and knotweed and barberry were kind of coming up the peripheries of that side. Um, and so I was, I was pleased to see the changes there. But in our training, changing the mowing, and, and if we're going to move earth that has contaminated soil, it can't go back into, back into a space that you don't want it to grow, because it's going to grow. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. There's no question about it. It's, it's hard to control, and it's in a lot of places. And, you know, we try that sand pile in the center. It's mostly on the lower portion of the sand pile. It grows up. We put new sand in, and we take most of the sand out from the site that's closer to the highway garage. So uh, we're not actively trying to work in that mighty section of it, but it, it gets through. There's no question it gets yeah. through. It's just hard to know. You, you just don't know. Right. Yeah, and in terms of salt use, we have discussed it not just from a cost perspective, but environmental concerns, because we, we know it. I don't think it would be maybe good to get more education on that as a board, the environmental component to salt use and what other options may be out there as long as safety is not risked. I think yeah. that there's a lot of the discussion we've had about. That's where the challenge is, because again, I mean, uh, you know, sand is, we don't add salt to our sand pile anymore, so there's not a lot of additional salt in the sand, but when you spread sand instead of salt, and that ends up on the shoulder of the road, and then it ends up in the ditches and in the streams, you know, the yep. sand has a, a really significant impact that it, you know, if you silt up uh, gravel beds in brooks, then the fish are going to have, you know, the invertebrates have a tough time, and then, you know, that goes all the way up the food chain in the, in the, in the brook, in the, in the water ecosystem. So it's, it's a challenge, and I know, you know, Chris isn't here tonight, but, you know, he's of the mind that we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't put anything on the roads, you know, just let people, it's winter and drive differently. I would say that, that everybody needs to figure out the impacts of salt. It's a, I think folks are aware that it has an impact to the extent, uh, the extent of that impact is generally unknown. So we're interested in, in learning a little bit more about it ourselves. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a safety risk. Salt works. And um, the impact of salt on all kinds of water natural resources, wells, etc. Yep. It's all not good. And that's what we have discussed extensively on, you know, 
mitigating what our use of salt might might be, and it's a it's a it's a not an easy issue, you know. You know, I have definitely you know environmental concerns over the use of you know use of salt. I'm a little bit like, yeah, maybe we should all need to slow down a little bit, but I also don't think there's sometimes you just have to apply salt, you know, you know just for a safety aspect. And we have um, a long. We've got town or state roads here that probably aren't going to change your salt behavior anytime soon, too. Right. And and some of those uh, state roads have a greater impact on the environment than the town right. roads. Right. They're using those brines and stuff like that. Closer to waterways, closer to some of our exactly. And and less use, uh, less paved surfaces on on the town roads. Right. Comparatively. So I don't mean to interrupt, but I was talking to my head just about that. And he said we don't put salt on the roads to melt the roads. We put enough salt in the, in the sand pits so that they don't freeze, so that we could move the sand. Is that not correct, Bill? No, I, I'm like, pretty, I don't think we add salt to the sand anymore. We used to add salt to the sand to prevent it from freezing. I said that last fall, and I was told that we don't do that any longer. We do apply salt directly to paved roads when we, when, we, uh, when we apply salt. We do not apply salt to gravel roads because it permeates through down you know, the surface and it would really tear up those roads. So salt does not go on gravel roads. Um, <clears throat> we use it on paved roads. And the challenge, of course, is with warming. Um, you know, salt doesn't really work all that well if it's below, you know, if it's 20 degrees, Salt is more of a abrasive than it is a, a melter, but um, it's that 30, 32 degree snow, and it's really greasy. And if you don't, you know, put some salt on it, it can be very, very slippery. So it's finding the balance point. Exactly. How many members are on the commission right now? <clears throat> That's a great question, Mark. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out seven. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, of nine seats, seven, seven and nine seats, two open seats. Um, have you had any troubles recruiting? Like most most boards are having problems. Um, seven. We've been at seven. We we for the last five years we've been at or above seven, and okay. we even we even added to change your bylaws to add a couple seats to account for growing interest. Okay, you just growing grow. interest and also quorums probably. Yeah, you know, just yeah. getting more bodies at the table we thought was helpful, especially considering that there are some days when folks have other things to do. So just one last thing from, from me, uh, just so you folks mull it over. We talked a little while ago about you know, town forests. Can we have a town forest? Um, open land. Um, you know, just to remind everyone, Waterbury is about 60% owned by the state, the Mount Mansfield State Forest and the, and uh, what's the other one? Putnam oh, State Forest. So, you know, 60% of the land area in Waterbury is already in forest or or state control that way. And I'm not suggesting at all that we shouldn't be worried about the other 40% where we all live because connectivity and everything else. But I, sometimes people are surprised at that, uh, the uh, amount of uh, open land that we have, which is in those state forests. But with regard to um, you know town forests, uh, I worked in a town before that had one. Uh, Waterbury does not have a town forest per se, but the utility district owns 480 acres on the side of Hunger Mountain, that's a watershed. And um, it's open and available to the public for recreation. But as you indicate, there's more and more pressures on all of these open lands and people, uh, the, the recreational opportunities that people are seeking are much, um, more high intense uses than they used to be. When I first moved to Waterbury, people would go up into the watershed, they might cross country ski, 
there's a lot of snowshoeing up there. There was a lot of people that would go up and hunt. I used to go up there and fish. Uh, but now there's mountain biking. There's really high intense uses for uh, in cross country skiing. And just to let you know, the EFUN commissioners, the elected commissioners, are starting to reach out. Maybe you've had a conversation with Dan Sweet about this, but we're, we're talking with the people from WADA because and it spills over a little bit to the Hope Davy discussion, is that having uh, ownership and, and multiple uh, different people wanting different uses of the same property is difficult to manage. And, uh, you know, Mark and I were in a meeting last week, and you can have all the regulations and rules that you want, but if there's nobody out there to kind of police it and enforce it, it's, it's difficult. So. I'm just letting you know that I'm, I'm not here to say we shouldn't have a town forest, but uh, one of the other things that I think it would be good if the Conservation Commission would consider is how do we manage these public lands that we already own for conservation, uh, good land use management practices. And first and foremost, that 480 acres that EFOD owns, it's a watershed. It's the public watershed for, for the, you know, uh, thousand plus water customers that this community has and we've got a you know we've got a forest management plan we've got a, a watershed management plan these are all public documents already in place and uh, trying to balance what those properties are intended for why they were purchased in the first place and also be welcoming to the people that want to use it for recreation is it's becoming more and more of a challenge and I just want all of you folks, including Billy up there, to, to know about that. Agreed. And it's an intimidating challenge. And the Hope Davy it, it, it proves a, a, a very challenging yeah. issue. I don't, we don't. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. challenging. What would you say your number one, if you had one issue that you would pick as your top issue, what would you say that would be? Land fragmentation. Land fragmentation. Yeah. Just building. The there's still, you know, I think it's mainly because of our interests and strengths as a commission, too. You know, um, we don't. The conservation commission doesn't have currently have any authority over EFUD properties, over any parks in town. Our involvement in recreational committees or recreational activities is is pretty passive and we don't have a, a designated role in in any of that stuff we we haven't we've, we've only been recently asked to participate with Hope Davy and that's kind of the first um, partnering opportunity that we've we've taken advantage of and or been asked to do and so we would certainly welcome playing a role in thinking about the watershed or other other spaces. And, and, you know, just to throw another twist in, almost all of that 480 acres is yeah. in stuff. Right. You know, it's not yeah. even in water. Right. It's, it's in the town of stuff, so. Do, does the commission have any issues with the reservoir use? Because we, I know I've seen, I'm a user of the reservoir, and over the last several years, I think the pandemic has accelerated uh, the, I don't know if you want to call it overuse of, 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 the, of the reservoir, but we're seeing more and more use and more and more conflicts at the reservoir. Have you even talked about anything of that? I, it's probably safe to say the Conservation Commission has not. Um, okay. I'm a, I'm a neighbor to an access yeah. spot and conflicts abound and my use has dramatically been impacted quite negatively uh, in the last few years. Mm -hmm. The conflicts mostly are where are vehicular conflicts. The there's not a lot of uh, very accessible access right. points. The ones that there are get overcrowded. I mean, I use the reservoir quite often myself, and I've always been pretty happy once I get out on the water. It's you know there's people around, right. but you can I can go places and 
and fish and not be bothered right. and not be in people's Rainy mornings are perfect. Way, right? <laughs> exactly. I remember the quiet use things. See, if people wanted to have quiet use on July 4th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you go out any morning between 6 to 8 o'clock, you, you, you could have the reservoir almost to yourself. Yep. We, um, we don't. We haven't spent any time on it. I, uh, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, before we wrap up, is there anything we can help your group with from a board perspective? Well, I appreciate the question. I think knowing that um, private landowners in particular have a growing interest in, in conserving their property and finding solutions for those landowners is, is something that the Conservation Commission is helpful with, is, is interested in helping with. And so the municipality can help by providing just verbal support for that concept. A lot of organizations won't want to conserve, take an easement or take a donation of land unless it's supported by the town. And that might come through a letter from the select board. It might come through evidence with the within the town plan. Um, it could come through financial support as a financial match where a conservation project requires X amount of dollars and some of that needs to be come, come from, from the municipality. We, I hope that we will have uh, some zoning regulations come in front of the town and we will we'll need the select board's support on considering increased regulation on land that protects wildlife corridors, particularly the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor. So Does that create a new map designation on the zoning map? Yes. I think what we're proposing to do is, is modify the ridgeline, hillside, and slope district and expand that to, our, to include our Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor priority areas. Very similar language, but it, it would expand the jurisdiction of that. Which tends to be a density limitation minimum acre size yep um, in, in other kind of qualifying statements like no undue adverse impact on wildlife habitat or wildlife corridors and that that becomes a challenge when landowners either on the periphery of the municipality or within a forested ecosystem want to build a house and that house requires a road, it requires power, and it requires space to have a family. And you've got to cut trees and, and fragment the forest. Um, and we would ask, the Conservation Commission asks, that that development gets cited in a way that minimizes that impact, or in some cases ha has no undue adverse impact. How hard is it to create a rule book for landowners to understand? and select boards? I think that versions of that rule book already exist. Um, and like it probably in on steep slope and I know for hillside it's like sight lines, steep slope, maximum slope pitch. The rule book is not certainly not specific to Waterbury or the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor, but it is but it does apply to wildlife habitat and wildlife corridors and generally to the idea of fragmentation and the consequences of fragmentation and how municipal language and municipal regulations can and have been used to protect fragmentation, protect against fragmentation. It's an a and guide. a and &R, um, VNRC mm -hmm. was either a joint author in, in something, uh, but I can help provide either links or copies of those documents. Ultimately, it's in the hands of the, the DRB to, to kind of determine and, and, and deal with um, projects when they come to the table to not only pay attention to wildlife corridors and the language and the existing um, regulations, but understand what that means and know how, how residential development or commercial development impacts those resources. It's not, it's not easy. Not everybody knows. Did that answer your question? I think so. Yeah. I'm not going to write a book. <laughs> well, I think uh, 
I don't have any other questions. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I appreciate everything you're doing, and if we can help, please. I think I'd, I'd like to understand more about, especially the salt conversation as we plan for winter. We didn't use much last winter, I don't think. I think we were way down, right? Because yeah. you said you were doing some testing, right? Well, we are doing the testing, yep, yeah. but we just started, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, we were way down last year. Yeah. We, we only had half the crew working, so we uh, only put half the salt out. A question of procedure in open meetings. Are, are, are we back to mandatory open meetings yes. in-house? Yeah. And how about this technology? That is optional. Per per commission. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your only requirement is to have a physical meeting place and to be there. Either somebody has to be there. Somebody has to be here. Yeah. So one commission. One could be there, and everyone could be on Zoom if you, if should you wish. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Billy. Yeah, thanks, Bill. All right, select board business, item A. Continued discussion at our two meetings ago about the event at Murphy's Barn on August 7th, permit. Yeah, so this is actually a different uh, event. They had the event oh. that, that you gave them permission for in June, no issues with it. This is just a second event. I, so I think um, staff's recommendation is you can approve it. It was there was no issues the last time around. Similar hours and everything. Yeah, five to eight with the seventy-five minute show that includes a lot of the acts with four or five performers. Estimated attendees same. Uh, yeah. I think it, I think it's the same. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any board members have comments, concerns, or I'll take a motion? I can make a motion to approve the entertainment permit for an event at Murphy's Barn on August 7th. Okay. Second the motion. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 B. Just, Just try to remember that that's going to here. So oh, okay. Up Sorry. Bit. Yeah, Mark, it's not turning to you. I have to <coughs> speak up. Just okay, no problem. My throat's a little sore. Um, special event permit for Waterbury Arts Fest on September 10th and 11th. You have that? I have to cover for Karen. Yeah. Sorry. Um, RW Arts Fest, September 10th and 11th. We are requesting permission to close Stowe Street to vehicular traffic from Maine to Union and Railroad, as well as Bidwell Lane to Foundry from 10 a.m. on Friday, September 10th, to uh, 5.30 p.m. Sunday, Saturday, September 11th. Um, they will communicate with all the residents. They will kick off the festival with a Friday night block party at 5 p.m. Live entertainment until 9.30. They are requesting a half hour extension to the noise gardens for that evening. Uh, as part of the block party, there will be tent space on Stoge Street for a beer garden. Um, and there will be directional signs at entry points to town directing people to specific municipal parking locations. So this is really just a return to normal. The RW have had this Arts Fest for a number of years. Uh, it's pretty typically been in July. Um, because of the pandemic, they weren't sure exactly when things were going to reopen, so they scheduled it for September. Uh, you know, there's not been issues with this. They've had a few, you know, there's, there's always a few complaints from people who live in the neighborhood in particular. Um, a few years ago, there was a little bit of a dust up the complaints were a little bit uh, more vocal, and Karen Nevin was concerned about that and, and has really worked hard since then to try to be a lot more um, outward uh, looking when it comes to the 
the people that live and work in that community. So she's actually developed a, kind of a template in terms of going out, you need to communicate with these people by this time. And I actually took that template and shared it with the uh, people from the car show so that they could go out and do what they want. So I don't think this is a problem and we should approve it. Yeah, she, I mean, this is the cover, but she has a whole packet of how everything's going to work, timing and stuff, and yeah. how they're going to handle everything. Just out of curiosity, why was the extension of time if, if for no other reason? Just because we, we, need, we need to celebrate some more. Um, I'm just curious. Yeah, I can't even remember. She references the noise ordinance, and, and um, it might go to... 9 or 9 30 or something like that. So they're just yeah, asking for it to. I, I didn't go and look this up. So. so I have a little problem. I think I have to recuse myself because I might be the beer garden. You are? Mm -hmm. So you can't. You can't make I don't think I should that. vote on Can I? No. something that's financially. We can bring it up again the next week. Yeah, there's, there's time. Okay. Yeah. Except for that, you don't have any issues with it. No. Okay. I mean, it's, it sounds like it's the it's same thing we've done for the last number yeah. of years, except for last year. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll have to wait for your next meeting. All right. Um, C, discuss road closure Rotar Rotarian Way, July 19th, 9.15 a.m. to 10.45 a.m. The closure will allow for a ceremony to celebrate the return of Amtrak service. Right. So it's really pretty self-explanatory. That's the first day that Amtrak service will resume after being shut down since March of 2020. Uh, there's been a couple of test trains that have come through the community in the past three months or so. I've seen two or three of them. Um, so they're going to come through Waterbury. I think the train is supposed to arrive at 10.15. Um, they're going to have some people from the state and potentially, I know there'll be people from Amtrak here. <clears throat> I'm just going to have a little celebration in front of the railroad station at Rotarian Way. Uh, I sent an email to Ann today and uh, Barb is going to help find that out if you haven't already. But uh, this is the second event return of Amtrak service that I'll have been involved in. There was an interruption. I can't remember what year, but, uh, and I don't even remember why. Uh, Bill, uh, Rebecca Ellis was chair of the select board. Okay. And Shulman was governor. Mm -hmm. I haven't, I haven't. I don't think so. But we'll figure it out. That's not for. Right, for now, anyway. So are they, anyway, are they just doing Waterbury, or is there one in Essex and then one in Montpelier? Or I'm not sure. Um, they've, you know, the the more celebrations they have, the later the train will be. Right, where it's exactly. Going. That's that's um, what I'm thinking. Is so the I ceremony? Think sorry, who's putting the ceremony on? Is it Amtrak or uh, RW? RW. RW. Okay. Yeah, and I mean Amtrak will be involved, but I think the idea is. That all of this stuff starts at 9:15 and is pretty much over when the train arrives. It's hooray, right. and then the train goes. You know, so the event will be cut the ribbon. Cut the ribbon. Lisa says that there's celebrations at every stop. Okay, that's what I thought it might be. And is the work they're doing in downtown Burlington? Is that Amtrak? Is that going to be? Because right now you can't get to downtown Burlington, right? You end up in Essex. Right yeah, right. no, that's a whole different line. Yeah, of, there'll be a different train. Yeah, train. that's going to go if through Rutland. The Express will go from Rutland to Berlin. Okay. Different tracks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any further discussion? Or we'll take a motion. Take a motion to approve the road closure on road car carrying way July 19th between 9.15 and 10.45 for the Amtrak celebration. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please aye. say aye. 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 Discuss road closure. <laughs> Stowe Street, August 28th. Actually, it's 27th. Oh, sorry. 
It's a it was informed. Yeah. <laughs> Still Street, August 27th, 4 to 8 p.m. This closure is to commemorate the 10-year anniversary of Tropical Storm Irene and the end of a decades-long reconstruction effort. No, the completion of Main Street reconstruction. So again, self-explanatory. Um, I spoke with Barb Fire back um, right after the new year and said, you know, this is the 10th year since Irene. Uh, we've had a lot of stuff going on. So our W, she and, and Karen at our W talked about this. Um, and I think it, it makes sense. Uh, the Main Street Reconstruction Project, if you haven't noticed, uh, didn't finish by June 30th, which was the original intent. Um, it is uh, scheduled to go out through the end of August now, I believe. And the reason why it's going out through the end of August is because of the month and a half or so that they lost at the beginning of 2020 when the governor wouldn't let even construction companies work until the end of May. Um, so they, they're finishing up the Main Street project. But uh, there's a lot that has happened in this community since the flood. Um, obviously, we cleaned up from the flood. The state complex was torn down. They built a $140 million complex over there. Uh, we built this building, we built the roundabout, we replaced bridges over the, uh, you know, the interstate bridges, we reconstructed Route 2 to Bolton, we reconstructed Route 100 to Stowe, and we've reconstructed Main Street. And every single year there's been something big going on here. So uh, this will just allow us to kind of take stock of where we were and where we are now. and. Uh, Okay, great. Yeah. Great. It's good. Okay. And this is also an RW? Yes. RW is taking the lead on it. The town's involved as well, but uh, it's mainly RW. Okay. And we need a motion? Yeah. I enthusiastically make a motion to uh, approve a road closure on Stowe Street on August the 27th from 4 to 8, 8 p.m. for the, uh, to commemorate the uh, 10th anniversary of Irene and our decade-long reconstruction of our town. Second. Great. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Just remember your count. It's not going to be on my calendar. Okay. Item E, discuss additional racial equity training. Um, as we discussed earlier in the consent agenda items recently, the board went through some racial equity training. I think we all agree that more could be had, but it was a great first step. Um, so yeah, Bill, you said you followed up with Mary on that? Yeah, so um, even before the training that you had on the 21st of June, Mary and I had talked about the possibility of the prospect that there might need to be more than one uh, session. And without going into details, you were all there on the 21st. Uh, and the other two board members who aren't here tonight were both there. And um, while Mary had a pretty well laid out agenda for a variety of reasons, all of which I think were good, you kind of veered off that and you talked about things that were kind of prescient that you felt you needed to, to talk about as, as a board and as individuals. Um, so the, the, tr the classical training, if you will, that she had prepared uh, was not delivered, so to speak. Um, I think Mary thinks it would be helpful if you would agree to meet again and allow her to to kind of take you through the agenda that she had set up. Obviously, I think it's safe to say that um, freewheeling is acceptable, that you know, she's not here to just say, look, we've got to get through these items and we can't veer off. Uh, it's a kind of a dynamic, fluid uh, event. And um, I think she, th she thought it was very much worthwhile. So she has penciled in your next meeting, July 19th, 
as another training night. Um, initially, when I had talked to her about that, is the 19th their next training? Is that in London? Yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Because we had thrown out some other dates as well. Um, there was some talk between Mary and me about, well, is this training something that staff should be involved in? Uh, there are other elected officials. There's a whole other municipality. Uh, some of those boards have expressed interest. But I think that from my perspective, and I'm only speaking for myself, given what you did at the meeting on the 21st and where you didn't get at that meeting, I think you should just reserve. If you're going to do more right now, I would just reserve it to, your, to yourselves. I think the board could uh, benefit from going through the agenda as she had laid out without having staff involved. I mean, I think this is pretty, um, it was critical. I think it was very helpful that it was really just the board and Carla and me the other night. There were things that could be said and you didn't have to worry about, you know, is it going to step on somebody's toes who's a staff member or a, a, a member of an elected body from a different, from a different board. So that's the question. A, are you up for additional training? Do you want it? Do you want to take this to the next step? Uh, it's your choice. Uh, and if so, do you want to do it as early as the 19th? Or we've got lots of stuff on our agendas to do. It's a, you know, just like the 21st, if you have that meeting, we'll get to it in a minute. Um, you've got this issue with the Harwood board vacancy and you might have to have based on the school board's timing, if you want to be involved in the pro process, you may have to do something on the 19th with that. And you could do that and then just move into your training. Um, you can ask Mary, would like to do it, but would just, a, a different date is better. So it's really your choice, but that's where I've been with her. So. I, my personal opinion, what, what I thought the training was excellent. Uh, I do like the idea that it was a little freewheeling. Uh, people got to express opinions, and I think that was good, you know, that we spoke among ourselves and the two uh, town, town officials. I, would I think, like Bill, I would like to continue that, but I don't think the 19th is a good idea for the fact that we have, we, we have the one, uh, article that we passed on today that we couldn't vote upon, so we need to do something on that. And uh, I'm almost suggesting that we have something like out of our normal loop of meetings. That's my opinion. So I'm doing on a completely non-meeting non night. Non-meeting night, you know, so we keep on doing the business of the town and this is kind of, you know, I think it's important enough that we have a, a special meeting you know, for, for this. And it doesn't, it doesn't slow down any progress that we have for any town business, my opinion. I'm all for doing another training. I really liked that one. Um, if we don't do it on the 19th, um, I'm gone the rest of that week, so preferably not during those days. Um, and I don't know if she set up how we were sitting, but I kind of like, my personal opinion, if we would sit in like a round table kind of thing so we can look, I don't know. That she had set that up. She, oh, okay. Well, maybe we can bring it up. Um, and just a side note, talking about uh, the school board, have we received any letters of interest from anybody? One. One? Okay. Well, next on the agenda. Yeah, just. Okay. Is there the option of having the training from like four to seven instead of seven to 10? Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, uh, she wanted it. Really. She would, yeah. you know, and it might, I, I, you know, I, she's, we talked about that in terms of logistics and, you know, she ended up staying overnight, which we ended up paying for. I'm not sure that she would drive back even if it was a four to seven thing, you know, it's, you know, she's got to get here and she kind of joked and says, my days of, you know, driving to a venue and then having the meeting and then driving all the way home are kind of over. So it might not make that much of a difference. Um, I haven't explored any other dates with her other than the 19th. The 19th was picked 
when we were first starting to try to even meet on the 21st. It was just a date that was thrown out there that she had kind of kept. My guess, Katie, is that she's fairly busy, and if it's not the 19th, it's, it's probably going to be a little bit further out than that. I don't think it's going to be like the 20th or the 21st or okay. something like that. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's I think I have similar thoughts of Mike on this, except that I do want to not get caught too too far down the, the road. Um, I do think that, you know, there was discussion that she was going to send us. Did we ever get the training? The, the training the slides? Yeah. I don't think she sent that. Yeah. No. So, I mean, I, I do think that, like, there's work that we're going to all have to do outside of those trainings. And then I am a little concerned pushing it too far out. I think it's important that we continue and get back onto her training program just to see everything that she was trying to talk to us about. Um, I don't know. I think I could go either way on this one. But I also don't know the availability of the other two board members, and I think it's important that all five of us attend. I'm a little concerned about the four to seven, just because if we're in good discussions, I. You know, that backs us right up to sure. a, another board meeting. All right. Bill's looking. Well, it wouldn't be before your yeah, I did, uh, a different day. Up. I didn't, on an I didn't take Katie's oh, okay. suggestion I as I could four, say four to seven on the 19th. No, it's alternate day. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, and I think the idea of doing it, trying not to do it as a substitution for a select board meeting meeting but an additional date I, I, I'd be in support of. I think that's something. That well, so here's here's the other option. Um, you could, we picked the 19th because it was a, a select board meeting night and you know, everybody misses once in a while. Chris and Danny aren't here tonight. But the expectation is on the 19th, normally you'd all be available because that's a select board right. night. So if you want, we can keep the 19th for that. We might have to do the Harvard thing. You know, we could meet at 6.30. You know, it depends on how many uh, candidates we get and whether or not you want to interview them. Um, so we could do that earlier and then have that meeting. And then do select board meeting on the 26th or something. So, and then you know, just push the regular select board meeting off to the next week. Mm -hmm. I'd be in support of that. Mm -hmm. I think knowing that potentially if we say no to the 19th that we're going to be pushing it to August or September. Well. All right. I agree with that. If we have to do it like the 20, 26th or something like that, let's just do that. And I guess what I'd suggest then is that if at all possible, if the board could keep from six to seven available to do the Harwood stuff if we had to and then start the training with her. And then if we, you know, if we only have one candidate, if we don't need to meet with people, we can just inform you that, you know, seven o'clock is fine. But maybe for now we can try to, if we have candidates that you want to interview, we could do that from six to seven. Okay. Separate for uh, no motion needs to be made on that, correct? No. Okay. And we're well outside of the warning period for those meetings. Yeah. Okay. Um, moving on, unless anyone else has anything. Um, item F, discuss vacancy on Harwood Board and process for appointing a new member. I guess it's HUUSD School Board. Carla? Yeah. Could you get Steve, because I'd like him to be here for the um, CD5, I think. Um, is that next? It's after, it's after this. So. Um, so I think you all have heard Michael Frank has uh, resigned from the Harwood Board. Uh, he was just elected not too long ago. And um, I don't really know, I haven't talked with Michael, but He's, he's not on the board any longer. Um, the law for filling vacancies uh, 
allows the school board to fill the vacancy, which is a little bit of a, uh, I think it's bad law, personally, because you're going to have the Harwood board uh, members from Waitsfield and Warren and the other five towns other than Waterbury who get the right to choose who Waterbury's representative is. And I don't think that's fair, but that's what the law is. And we have to go to that tomorrow. So the current law uh, leaves the school board with the authority to appoint, and they are supposed to seek input from the select board. Uh, it doesn't really de define what input is, but um, Tori Smith uh, from the school board, as well as uh, Caitlin Hollister, have both reached out to me. They have uh, put a notice out asking for people to send letters of interest if they are interested. Uh, they have received one. What they would like to do is share those letters as they come in with me. I can get them to the select board, and if the board wants to uh, interview those candidates and then make a recommendation. They don't have to accept your recommendation, but that's the process that they've kind of laid out. I think that's really the, the best we can do given what the law says right now. <clears throat> so there's no action that you need to take tonight um, if, if what we laid out a minute ago works for you as these letters come in I'll forward them to you right. and if we get more than one and you want to interview yes we get closer to the meeting we can you know, let Mark know how you feel we should interview we don't need to interview and then we'll figure it out as far as morning the meeting is concerned you going to throw your hat in the ring Bill? am I going to? I can't <laughs> Um, prohibited by law from serving on that. I think you'd be a good fit, Bill. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Um, I added in there the CV fiber. That's the next item. Yeah. I just asked Steve to uh, sit in on this. Um, so, several meetings ago, at the request of, I can't remember the gentleman's name, was some colleague guy. Right, Dwayne uh, Peterson. Right. Right. So we had some input at a select board meeting about the fact that there's a lot of places in Waterbury that don't have real good connectivity as far as uh, internet is concerned. And uh, they realized the CV, CV fiber was out there and wondered whether the town uh, had, any, um, had any affiliation with it. And we had. So the select board agreed to uh, join and uh, is, has expressed its willingness to appoint uh, a delegate and an alternate to the CV fiber board. Steve threw up this nice ad that we run on the website, we put on the front porch forum. And today, nobody, including the people who were here at that meeting, have volunteered to uh, serve on this board. Um, you know, I talked to Steve about it. Uh, he, he's kind of in the know on this a little bit from some of the other hats he wears with the Regional Planning Commission and the like. But like most staff members, uh, you know, Steve politely declined. He's already, are you the chair of the, the Planning Commission now? I'm currently chair of the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. And just, on the task just now. Became that and chair attack. of the attack as well. Yeah. So, so, you know, Steve's so, got the transportation advisory committee. All of his commitments here with the planning commission and the DRB, uh, and he's already uh, the town's representative to the regional planning commission and, and to the transportation advisory commission. So, we don't have anybody. I just want you to know that, that we're not kind of shirking our responsibility. But if people are interested in having this happen uh, and having Waterbury have a role, we, we need somebody to go to meet and stuff. Wow. Well, I'm on one of those roads. I'm sure I could probably, I don't know if my neighbors are aware of it, but I could put it out to them. That would be great, yeah. I don't Draw know if up some interest. And, you know, I think for, for right now, if you do talk to somebody and they express any interest at all, and the reason I want Steve here 
at the meeting now is they should contact Steve because he has what is more, the more information than anybody here in the municipality about this. So. Okay. Like, so, I mean, if, if someone asked me that, you know, they're more than willing to do it, is how does it, how does it, what is the process from what we did the other day? Like, is it identifying, continue to identify the houses in the community that don't have broadband, which I'm sure from an educational perspective, everything, there's a reason for trying to do this, but then what is the next, what are the expectations that this, is it a company or is it a like Well, CV Fiber is, uh, I think, a, a nonprofit, as I understand it, uh, organization. And um, so they meet monthly, uh, the board meets monthly, um, they, be a municipality. they might be a municipality, you're I right. I may be wrong. Economic Development Commission or something. something like that. Well, well, they're a, um, what's the proper name that the legislature set up the, for these um, community broadband? Uh, there's a name for those types of organizations, so they're, they fill that role. So <clears throat> they've done a lot of mapping and analysis already. Uh, this fellow, Dave Healy, who's their representative from Calus, I believe, is a geographic information system specialist. And he has um, done a lot of mapping and analysis already. So uh, I think really a, a delegate or an alternate, alternate delegate would need to be willing to attend a monthly meeting and then follow up on any uh, detailed potential projects in Waterbury in terms of uh, advocating for Waterbury with the board. And so they wouldn't take any steps forward unless somebody represents Waterbury on these, in these meetings? Is that well, that's how we become active. That well, it's not correct. that they wouldn't take steps forward, except <laughs> right. Waterbury's interests are not right. being represented. Yeah, that's meetings. a good way to put it. Yeah. And you know, they're, I'm sure I shouldn't say I'm sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's some talk at these meetings about identifying, you know, potential funding sources. Now with the, uh, you know, the American Recovery Act and the potential infrastructure acts that are coming down the pike. Even though there's arguments whether broadband is should be considered infrastructure or not between Republicans and Democrats, um, you know, I I think that we're just we just don't have a seat at the table right now. And I'm not sure, because we don't have a representative, they probably know that you don't have service on your road, but they also might think that you don't care because your town isn't involved right now. So, um, and, and I think, you know, we, we kind of, um, we kind of missed the boat when this first started taking off and it was really way back while this building was still under construction and there was just there's a lot going on and we had stuff that we were concentrating on and this didn't kind of rise to the surface and it wasn't until the folks who came here a few meetings ago said gee whiz you know we could benefit by something from this so Would i'm just letting you know that nobody Nobody's raised their hand to say I'm interested in being appointed at this point. So Lisa has like, suggested that uh, Steve or Bill, you give her information to put in the roundabout. Yeah. Okay. Way to publicize it. Yeah. Do a short article. Yeah. Okay, I could do that. And when they sure. when they connect these maybe islands of non-broadband areas, do they allow other people along the way to then? Because fiber is not up in the center, even is it? Like um, other properties join? Yeah, I know in, this, in the discussion that I had with Dave Healy, th there is the <coughs> option of, of coming into Waterbury Center from Stowe, right. potentially. So um, other than Comcast, cable, and which uh, is cable, obviously, and then the fiber that exists that Consolidated has that's in the core area, there there is not fiber. So. Presumably, it would be a new service that would uh, end up serving it's certain areas. It's a good service. I mean, I live on Ripley Road, and I'm a, I'm a Comcast customer now. I'm, I don't have a big, huge need, but I have pretty good internet service. Yeah, me. cable is, is good. Uh, would, would someone like Bill Butler, who represents Bob it? Butler. Bob Butler. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
who represents the town, who he might be a good person. Maybe you could talk about. Potentially. Anyway, I just wanted to bring that back to the board's attention that you know we we haven't dropped the ball on this. It's just yeah. that nobody has perked up yet. So if, so if there's any way you can help get the word out, we'll work with Lisa. Yeah, I'll be glad to work to with try to get with Lisa. Sure. Out. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. Okay, very welcome. Another un 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 for un thankless job. Well, it's all important, right? It's, it's very important, but there are a lot of jobs that are volunteer that are just, you know, people don't run for anymore. I guess I, I always say volunteerism is not dead, but it's, it's waning. Well, I think stretched thin is a good way to put it, too. Yes. <laughs> okay, Thank I'll you. be back. Sure. You're welcome. All right, moving on to manager's items. Discuss the American Rescue Plan Act. Okay, um, we talked about this just briefly a second ago. So uh, the American Rescue Plan Act has been passed and signed into law. Uh, there are a lot of uh, interesting and compelling items that are included in that act. Um, some of the stimulus checks that you folks all probably got back months ago were part of the precursor to that. Um, so for, to, for the purpose of tonight's meeting, um, this act is really the first time since, I don't know, 1983, 1984, 86, I think we were still getting federal revenue sharing, uh, which was a direct payment from the federal government to every municipality in the country. Um, and President Reagan decided that direct payments from the federal government weren't good. Uh, it would be better if they made payments to the states in the form of block grants, and then the states could divide that money out, and that's where the community development block grant uh, funding and program came from when federal revenue sharing was shut down. Uh, in the 80s. So all of the federal money that we have received from the mid to late 80s through now has always come through the state. Uh, and the state has been able to add strings and their uh, you know, uh, public policy initiatives get uh, kind of attached to that. Um, through this ARPA bill, which is now law, um, municipalities will receive a direct payment from the federal government that does come through the state treasury. But the state doesn't get to put any strings or any kind of caveats on the money. So there's going to be $100 per capita that's going to be distributed to um, the municipalities of this country. And that means Waterbury is in line to get almost $540,000. It will come in two payments, uh, one probably within 60 days of now, and the other likely sometime in the first half of 2022. Could be late this year, but my, my guess it would be 2022. So um, I don't want to belabor this, but the deal is that the federal government will send us this money if the select board passes a motion to accept it. Uh, so they're giving towns the ability to say, no, we don't want your money, send it somewhere else. Uh, I hope that you won't do that. Uh, we have three years to decide how we will use the funding, uh, but we have about uh, eight more days to decide to take the funding. July 15th, we have to let the uh, let the state know that we want the money by July 15th. Um, I've put together on this uh, agenda that I sent out to you the other night that you have at your tables, uh, there's three motions. Uh, first, the select board has to decide to accept the funding. If you decide that you want to accept the funding, then you have to appoint an authorized representative and a designated contact person for the program. I think it's all pretty simple. Um, and I would recommend that you do it. There are some uh, rules and regulations as to how this money can be used, but 
the, the best one and the easiest one and the one that I recommend that we will uh, use when we take our, our money, if you should decide to take it, is that it will replace revenues that were lost due to the pandemic. And there's a complicated formula. They ask you to look back uh, three years and to see if your revenue uh, didn't increase by at least 4.1% per year. And if your revenue did increase by at least 4.1% per year from 2018 till now, uh, they consider that lost revenue. So we have actually um, received less revenue than a 4.1% increase. We actually have a, a, we lost revenue last year. So um, if we take this money and we use it as uh, to replace that lost revenue, essentially what we'll do with it is put it into a fund. We have to account for it separately, put it in single bank account that we have, but we'll have to create another fund. And then because we'll consider it lost revenue, we just get to appropriate it through our normal budgeting process in 2022. So we don't have to come up with, well, we're gonna use it to do X, Y, or Z. We can have these conversations, uh, but as a normal part of the budgeting process. So for us, I think it will be quite a simple process. And with that, I'll stop talking and let you ask a question if you have any. And if not, ask you to take action on those three bullet points. Is there any strings that we need to be concerned about? No. That's what I there, think. There's, there's a little bit of reporting requirements that, that are Technical necessary. Uh, but there's no, you know, you can't, you can't, there are a few things that you can't use it for directly right now, but because it's lost revenue from our perspective, we have much more free reign over how we're going to use it going down the road. And frankly, we can pr pretty much use it for any, any government project that we want, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's staffing, or what have you. But <coughs> it's pretty easy for us. It's, uh, it's really no strings attached. If, if it's no problem, can I just consolidate the three into one motion? I think you ought to do three motions, just okay. because the direction that we've gotten from the federal government is these three motions need to be acted on. So. Okay. I'm just a John Dewey pragmatist. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll make a first motion. I move that the town of Waterbury accepts its allocation of the coronavirus local fiscal fiscal recovery funding from the U.S. Treasury along with the award terms and conditions and assurance of compliance with the civil rights requirements of accepting these funds. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 I move the select board appoint the municipal manager, William Shepluck, to serve as the authorized representative of the town of Waterbury as required by the coronavirus local fiscal recovery funding from the U.S. Treasury to sign the award terms and conditions and assurances of compliance with the civil rights requirements as of July 6, 2021. Is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 I move the select board appoint the municipal manager, um, William Shepluck, to be the contact person for the coronavirus local fiscal recovery funding award from the U.S. Treasury to the town of Waterbury. Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 I got a red light. Hi, lady. <laughs>
wants to wait, though. Yeah, Steve's coming. So we're all set with the coronavirus stuff? Thanks all done. Did it in three. What were the revenues lost besides the pool? Well, the major one was that you that you reduced the tax rate from fifty five cents right. to fifty one. So that's three hundred. Right, that's three hundred and twenty thousand. Okay. Gonna add. okay. <clears throat> but then you know there were higher going <coughs> tax tax delinquency was higher than uh, than it usually is in terms of the percentage rate. Uh, and there were recreation fees that were down. I um, can't remember, zoning fees may have been up a little bit, I, I can't remember. Talking about Last 2020. year? Yeah, yeah, we had a surprising amount of activity. It was up a little bit. But anyway, the tax, the tax rate was the big, okay. the big thing. Uh, we're moving on to item B, consider reorganization of planning and zoning department. And this is a continued discussion that we had the other week as Dina is retiring. Right. Yeah, so um, pretty straightforward. Uh, we talked about it a couple weeks ago. Uh, Martha Staskis came in from the Planning Commission that night to talk about uh, what this would mean. Initially, I had talked with Steve about this concept, thinking that maybe there was an opportunity to kind of cut spending a little bit, wondering if we did some things differently that we could cut back on the number of hours. Um, Martha raised some serious concerns about that at, the, at that select board meeting. Uh, there was some general discussion by the select board. I spoke with Steve uh, considerably after that, and I think that given you know, what he just said, that 2020 was a really busy year, I, I think that it was a little bit high in the sky to think that we could really cut that time back. I mean, the, the proposal that we have will allow more than one person to actually uh, work on zoning applications. Whether we actually have two people doing it at the same time is a, is a different issue. But I think for, uh, for now and going forward, the idea that we're going to be able to do this with less than two 40-hour full-time people is probably not, not reasonable to, to think that. Um, they both have, um, you know, Steve's a salaried individual right now, so like me, you know, there are many weeks that he's putting in more than 40 hours, he's going to board meetings uh, and the like. Dina is, a, is an hourly employee. Uh, she tries to, uh, she tries to work her schedule so that on the weeks that she has board meetings that she doesn't come into the office and they work quite a bit, but there is overtime that does happen in, in this uh, situation. And I just think that it's not really feasible to do what we're doing with the number of applicants that we have and all that's going on with the Planning Commission, with the, you know, the rewrite of the zoning bylaws and, and things that uh, you know, Alan talked about with the Conservation Commission. So I, I think staffing levels are going to have to remain right where they are. So with that, I mean, I sent out the job descriptions. Steve and I have had conversations with Joe McLean, our attorney, to make sure that this concept can work in a town like Waterbury because unlike Stowe and Williston, who have a, who have a, a an organization structure like we're proposing, uh, those two communities have charters. This structure is spelled out in their charter and they clearly have the authority to do it. Uh, I was a little concerned that uh, you know, we might run afoul of the law, but Joe McLean looked at it and said that he believed it would be okay to do this in the, in the manner that we laid out. So Steve had written the job descriptions um, Joe tweaked them a little bit, uh, and I think we're all set to go. So, Dina is, her last day is Friday. Um, <coughs> I've already told Steve <coughs> whether the 
<coughs> select board approve this organization structure or not tonight. Um, he's going to be the acting zoning <laughs> administrator come the end of the day Friday. Uh, and we won't have Dina's position filled for a little bit of time. It's not my strategy to, in this case, you know, take months and months to fill the vacancy in order to save money. There will be a little time that goes by before we can get somebody up and running. It's, it's, in the best case scenario, it takes about a month to fill a position. So it's probably going to be a little longer than that. So Steve's here. I sent out the, the uh, job descriptions. If you have any questions, staff's recommendation is that you approve the new structure. Where are you putting these out? Where? Yeah, where are you yeah, posting we, the jobs? You mean in terms? We haven't done any posting. We haven't ever right. had. The select yeah. board hasn't said we can't. I know, but like, where are you going to? We put the, you know, we will put it in the, in the newspaper, uh, it'll go in the Times area, so it'll go in the, in the rec, uh, roundabout. Um, we'll probably post it. There's a ELCT job site that we can post to. Um, the Planners Association yep. has a site that we can Yeah, we have a listserv that we'll publicize so. it on, and we're also part of a Northern New England chapter of our association so we'll we'll post it in those areas and try to cast a fairly broad net we we really would like to find somebody who has a uh, planning background as well as zoning and, and the legal uh, background um, and I think we talked before about wanting this to really emphasize customer service and yet um, you know it has to be someone who, with some good technical skills ability to read plans and that and that type of thing so I think we're um, we're hopeful that we can find someone who has a, a broad range of skills. Bill and I were kidding the other day about how we're really jacks of all trade, and we're hoping that this reorganization plan will keep uh, really a teamwork approach where both um, you know I'll continue in a number of different roles, but this new position would also have some flexibility and be able to uh, uh, focus primarily on on zoning. We really want to reactivate the enforcement program that we have and also um, be available to assist with some of the planning functions as well. Alyssa is here as well on the call. Uh, we had a follow-up discussion at the last Planning Commission meeting that I thought was very helpful. They had some good comments uh, that have been incorporated in the job descriptions, and I know uh, they've advocated for the assistant position to be full-time, and, and um, you know, I mentioned that that uh, the select board and, and the bill were leaning in that direction as well so which board do you serve on i'm on the drb and i'm pleased to hear what i heard this evening i'm here for this purpose um I'm, i've served now for about a year and uh i think the volume of work and the complications of some of the jobs that we're dealing with um it's hard for me to fathom that we would be able to function with the current workload with just one employee. Um, the decisions are not simple. Um, they're subjected to appeals. Um, they're, they're complicated in a lot of ways regarding process. And I appreciate the notion of trying to be as prudent as we can be in delivering the services, but um, I think we would be dropping the ball if we did not have qualified people substantially full-time it, it was never intended to go just to one person Harry but uh, you know right now both Dean and Steve work 40 hours and I had some thought that maybe the second person could drop down to maybe 30 or 25 but I think given the current climate as you've been here the whole meeting you know Alan Thompson was talking about real estate is really booming there's there's going to be interest in subdivisions. There's right. there's a lot of development happening, and we're right in the midst of the zoning rewrite that can't be forgotten either, because some of that has a lot of impact for that particular property. Even that Alan uh, was talking about the one that you brought up, uh, you know, near the Fish and Game Club. So, uh, anyway, yeah. So the other thing I wanted to add is that um, in our discussions with. Um, 
Joe McLean, the attorney, he wanted to make sure that we had an acting zoning administrator position description, even though um, I currently <laughs> serve, bless you, currently serve as acting zoning administrator. I've been nominated and uh, by the planning commission appointed by the select board um, at the beginning of the pandemic. So I can go back into that role under that current appointment. But in the future, um, with the current structure, we want to make sure that if for any reason uh, one of these uh, people goes on leave or uh, there's a reason why we might need an acting zoning administrator, we want to make sure that there's a, a, um, a position description. So that, that's been added to the uh, whole package or reorganization, if you will. But it's not three positions. It's no, it's three. not. The acting uh, will not be necessary unless for some reason both of the people are, are absent due to some okay. uh, Joe just circumstance. Joe just best to have the job description in place that was very clear with a you know, good description of what the duties were, but there's no intention of having three positions. No, not at all. I, I really like the idea that treating this whole thing as a team. Uh, I think that's one really important. Have a team, one to have backup. I also think it's good for potential succession. You know, Steve's kind of said that he may not, you know, be working that much longer. Well, I'm retiring a year well, from this coming March, to be quite precise. <laughs> try, to, try to be kind. No, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, but um, I think it's really important that there is a potential if the person's working for succession also, sometimes if we would have that person, say, as part-time, sometimes people truly want part-time work. Mm -hmm. They don't want full-time work, so that succession might be kind of potentially, in, you know, interrupted. Uh, I think the descriptions were well done uh, of, of the jobs, and I'm very much for it. The only thing I may want to suggest is we may want to look at advertising in seven days. Seven days is a really good place for stuff like planning and stuff like that. Because it, one, it's a free newspaper to, pe to people. You know, it's not free to advertise, but you know, it'd be a good place to reach. I think the planning types. Always. That's a good suggestion. Yep. Good idea. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I think you're all on the right track. Good. Thank you. Do we, is there a motion involved in this? Yeah, I think that we should just uh, move to, uh, to uh, go forward with the restructuring of the planning and zoning department as recommended by staff. So moved. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion on the topic? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Since Dina's oh. not here tonight, congratulations, Dina, on her retirement. Yeah, well, she's in the other room. Oh. She's, she's working, <laughs> getting ready for the development review board meeting tomorrow. We're teaming up as during your meeting. So, but I'll let her know. That's good. Okay, thanks, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Alyssa. <clears throat> thank you. I uh, full time, and I found both of my jobs on seven days, so strongly second my first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Good. Thanks, Thanks. All right. Uh, item C, consider letter of support for the Vermont Employment Growth Incentive Veggie by MTX Group, Inc., a prospective new business hoping to locate in Waterbury. Yes. So, um, Mark Emilio of uh, Revitalizing Waterbury, Alyssa's uh, successor, uh, reached out to me last week and told me about this company, MTX Group, and their desire to come at, and locate in Waterbury. Um, they've been working quite uh, heavily with the Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation, Jamie Stewart there. We are members of that corporation, uh, contribute $2,500 a year, and they, they they serve as you know economic development clearinghouse, if you will, working with communities and trying to work with the SBA, rural development. Uh, I'm sure Mike has mm -hmm. much experience working with uh, the, the uh, regional uh, development commissions around the state. 
Anyway, um, this, this company wants to come to Waterbury. Um, I don't have a lot of real great information about them. I marvel as I get older how much less and less I understand about what companies do out there. So, uh, you know, they're a company that um, they have a lot of government contracts. They, I just took this off of their website. Uh, this, this map and this app. This app allows clients, clients to manage the entire case management life cycle from initial contact by internal or external stakeholders through resolution and follow-up features robust functionality to configure workflows tailored to business needs, enable multiple escalation paths, and centralize all items needed in handling feedback or help cases. That's all one sentence. A highly intuitive system enables all stakeholders in the process the ability to collaborate together, and then they list the list of benefits. Um, so I don't really understand almost anything that I've read there. Um, <laughs> it's a high-tech company. Um, they, uh, they do systems analysis uh, for big uh, organizations lots of universities, a lot of government companies. Here's uh, kind of a list of some of their customers, Brown University, City of Chicago, Harvard Business School, uh, Iowa Department of Agriculture, New York Port Authority, State of New Mexico, and so on. So they have a, uh, as I put in the memo the other day, uh, they have basically, if you will, corporate co-headquarters. I think one is in New York State, and the other, I believe, is in Texas. They're looking to establish some additional regional hubs, and they're looking to uh, come to Waterbury if they get this veggie grant, uh, which is uh, basically an employment incentive grant. That's the way it will be viewed from their perspective. So they're hoping to start off with about 100 employees in Waterbury. Uh, they will be recruiting people. When people with, think about buying a product or service, they consider things such as hands. reliable. Technical degrees from uh, obviously colleges and universities, uh, software engineers and other computer analysts and, and the like. Um, my understanding is the hope is that they will move from 100 employees when they start up to about 250 over a 7 to 10 year period. Um, I think the location is likely somewhere in Pilgrim Park is where they're looking. Uh, and I sent to you the draft of this letter that I have prepared which basically is telling the uh, Vermont Economic Progress Council, which is the organization that decides on the veggies that we support this company coming to work. So. And is it the belief that this letter will help, hopefully, are they, they're looking at other cities and? Well, from what I understand, and I had a conversation with Jamie Stewart from the Economic Development Corporation last week, and, um, they have decided that if they come to Vermont, they're coming to Waterbury. This is, this is where they want to be here. Um, they haven't said if they don't get this, they're not coming, but obviously there's incentives for them. And the, you know, the way the grant works, it's kind of, I don't know how much it is, but every year they get measured on the uh, progress towards the goals that they had in terms of uh, what they've laid out to the uh, uh, Economic Progress Council, and in this case, it's a number of the number of jobs and their gross payroll and the like. And um, let's just say it's a it's a fifty thousand dollar incentive over a five year period. After the first year, they will measure, and if they hit the target that they're supposed to get in that first year, they will get, um, you know, one-fifth of, of their total. And then the next year, 
it's kind of the, it builds upon itself. They would get that same amount of money plus uh, some additional money for the second year. And then when they're about halfway through the cycle, that's when they'd be getting the most money coming from that grant. And then as they move forward and they allegedly or theoretically need the incentive less, it will go down the bell curve and they'll receive less money. So over the over the five year period, they will get the whole amount of money that they applied for. And I'm just picking $50,000 in five years out of the air. I don't know the parameters of this, but that's how uh, Jamie explained how, the, how it worked. So from our perspective, it's, it's uh, you know, they're good paying jobs. Uh, there are people that will be in our downtown, presumably some of them are going to want to live here. The company is excited about Waterbury because of where it's located and all of the things that all of us already like about being here. And it's, a, it's an attractive place for young professionals who they hope to be recruiting for these jobs. So, um, and I can't tell you that it won't cause some you know, unforeseen problems down the line in terms of growth and you know, uh, I've already heard how tight the housing market is and everything else, but it, uh, I think there's a lot of potential benefits for us, so. Okay. I'm um, just, I just thought, <clears throat> that's what, what I just did. I just looked up their better business rating and they're rating A plus, which is to me is real, because there are companies like this that are very much smoke and mirrors and, Usually the BBB rating, if if it's if if it is a more marginal company, won't be that high. So that gives me a lot of comfort. Um, and we we love good paying jobs here in, in, in Waterbury. You know that's what our community needs. Yeah, and it's exciting to hear that. I'm assuming these were offices that were previously Greenmount Coffee Roasters. I think so. Yeah. So I mean, it's nice to see infill. That potentially we have yeah infill. Um, all right. So I think I need a motion for the signature on the letter that we received. Right. Yep. I make a motion to uh, approve the letter of support drafted by the town manager for the. Veggie Employment Growth Incentive Grant for MTX. And to authorize. To authorize me to sign it. And to authorize Bill Shepliff to sign it. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, it's moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. I like Thank the you. acronym Veggie. <laughs> All right, Stowe Street Bridge Schedule Alternatives Presentation Meeting. Okay. Um, so the bridge at the top of Stowe Street uh, that comes off of Route 100 and ends at Lincoln Street, um, functionally obsolete, uh, structurally has some issues that we've dealt with over the past number of years. Uh, we did some deck work there a while ago. We had to do some refurbishing of the, the structure that takes the sewer line across that bridge. Uh, anyway, we have, uh, this bridge has been on the radar screen for the town and VTRANS and the Regional Planning Commission for a number of years, and we're moving towards getting something done. We're still a long way away from construction, but just as the Agency of Transportation came in, I think it was sometime in 2020, to talk about the bridge on Route 2 that goes across Little River that mm -hmm. at some point here, not too long, they will uh, pick up the ball and, and start working on that. Uh, they have been analyzing this bridge and they have uh, come up now with a, with a proposal. Part of their uh, process is to have an alternatives presentation to the select board. Uh, We've chosen Monday, August 2nd, which is a regular select board meeting night. Uh, probably take a half an hour or so. Um, 
Anne tells me that it's a 176 page report that has been boiled down to a 40 page more or less executive summary. So they're going to talk to you about what the alternatives are to replace that bridge, um, how they might go about doing it, and then they'll tell you what their recommendation is, and then also tell you what that's going to mean in terms of detours, pedestrian access, and the whole thing. So um, you have to agree to allow them to hold the meeting. So that's really what I'm asking you to do today, is to just agree that on August 2nd, you'll have this meeting. Is, is August 2nd a select board meeting, or is this yeah. a special meeting? Okay. Special special meeting. Board meeting yeah. is, is there, would this bridge be eligible for ARPA money outside of what we're getting in, in the town? Could be. Could be. Good. Okay. That's what the idea is for infrastructure around the country. Let's right. get some in Waterbury. Right. All right. Uh, I need a motion. I make a motion to uh, schedule a August 2nd meeting with VTRANS to hear about the replacement of the bridge on Stowe Street that spans Thatcher Brook at Lincoln Street. Second. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Yeah. yeah, so unlike the bridge down on Route 2, this, this bridge is a town highway bridge. Right. So, um, you know, there will be, even through the state bridge program, it's an 80-20 match. Right. But, uh, yeah, there'll, there'll be other opportunities for funding, I'm sure. But mm -hmm. the difference between this one and that one is this is going to cost us some money. That one down on Route 2 is just inconvenience. All right, thanks. Great. I me set tax rate and bill it sent out an email on the second. Yeah. So, um, as I indicated in my email to you, um, we've got the information for the homestead and non homestead tax rates for education from the state. Um, the homestead rate is. 6.18 cents higher than it was in 2020, which is about a 3.5, 3.6% increase. The non-homestead rate uh, is $1.756. That's up 2.46 cents from a year ago. So the non-homestead rate is up 1.42%. Um, we have a nominal increase in the grand list uh, not quite eight-tenths of one percent. Uh, we budgeted for zero, um, so we, we beat zero, uh, which was nice. Um, the 7694A04, that represents one percent of the aggregate taxable fair market value in Waterbury, so you got to add a few zeros there to get the, the total, uh, if you want to know what that is. Um, that number will likely come down slightly. I'm not, I'm not worried about it enough that I think we should set the tax rate, I, uh, that we should set the tax rate higher. But just so you know, as always, uh, the assessor, Dan Sweet, has to get our grant list to the state in time for the state to do its analysis to come up with the education tax rate uh, the listers have a grievance after Dan sends that number to the state. So the 7.694804 is the grant list as it was lodged with the state. The listers had a, a, a grievance hearing on Friday last week. They had four, uh, four property owners that grieved. I don't know the uh, outcome of all of that yet, but I believe they will make an adjustment to at least one of those, which would lower this grand list slightly. <laughs> but that's the process that happens every year, and we always set the tax rate based on this number. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, that should say 2021 taxes necessary for the general fund. 
highway fund and library fund, not 2020. Uh, and the total taxes that the town is authorized to raise, uh, well, not the total that they will authorize to raise, but when, when we look at the budget and we look at the tax amount that was necessary to balance the budget, it's four million thirty nine thousand six ten. And uh, last year it was proposed at four million one ninety nine. So you can see just as we budgeted this year, we're about a hundred and hundred and uh, hundred and forty thousand dollars, hundred and fifty thousand dollars lower than we had approved a year ago. Uh, we gave away $305,000 last year, so only uh, billed $3.894 million uh, as opposed to the 4.039. So if we set the tax rate at 52 cents, which is my recommendation, um, that's about a, almost a 2% increase. We have authority to set the tax rate at 53 cents. At town meeting, the voters gave us the ability to set the tax rate at 53 cents. Um, <clears throat> the reason I'm recommending rounding down, we're still dealing with the pandemic, of course. There are some businesses and property owners that have struggled more than others. Uh, so I think the board was cognizant of that when we when we put the budget together this year, uh, we tried hard to keep the, the, the tax rate a little bit lower. We all understood that a year ago, we had a tax rate of 55 cents. We chose a target of 53 cents this year, which was two cents higher than we said a year ago, but still two cents lower than what we had authority to do last year. Um, the 52 cent tax rate that I'm recommending, however, is because some of the significant fears that I had about state revenues seem not to be coming to fruition. So this, it's still possible this could change, but it's very unlikely. The state has sent out now already the um, the memos for both current use and for pilot payments. So for current use, uh, we budgeted $35,000 payment from the state, uh, which is significantly lower than we got last year. The state is telling us right now, all indications are that we'll get $105,000, 105605 So we've actually going to have a windfall in that revenue line of about $70,000 more than we budgeted. On the pilot, we were even more conservative. Uh, we budgeted, um, we budgeted $180,000. Uh, it looks like we're going to get $351,000, so that's $171,000, almost $172,000 more than we, our worst case fears were. So between those two alone, there's about $240,000 of state revenue that we didn't think we were going to be getting this year. Um, $240,000 divided by the grand list is about three cents on the tax rate. Now there are other revenues that we may not hit our targets on. Recreation programming right now is, that money's coming in really well. Uh, we don't know what tax collections are going to be. There, there are people that are still hurting out there. So I think it's uh, reasonable to round this number down to 52 cents. Um, we're going to get $540,000 from the ARPA money that we'll be able to, that will basically drop to our bottom line uh, at the end of this year. So I think right now, going into 2022, um, my guess is that we'll probably have a reasonable surplus and we can talk about how we can use that to the benefit of the taxpayers, how much do we use that surplus next year towards keeping the tax rate manageable, how much do we put into you know, investing into infrastructure. 
uh, but that's a, a, a discussion we can have during the budget plan. We do have a few things in our budget this year that we're going to be at least nominally overspent on. Uh, we put money in the in the fire station capital improvement plan to repair the siding on the Weber Center fire station. Uh, we've done that work. That came in, you know, nominally ten thousand dollars more than we budgeted. Maybe uh, we had a boiler in the highway garage. Uh, that you know, when when they estimated it, uh, ultimately they they didn't think they were going to have to change out the heat exchanger. They ended up doing that. I just got that bill today, so we're going to be over there. Um, we've already talked about paving. Uh, we decided to do Blush Hill as opposed to Stowe Street this year. We're going to spend a little bit more on paving than we had initially planned upon. So I think 52 cents, it's a 2% increase, 1.96% increase over last year's tax rate on the municipal side. It helps take a little bit of a sting out of the, uh, you know, rather, you know, I won't say steep, but 3.5% increase on the, on the residential school side. So um, all in all, um, I think this is a, a, a reasonable number to pick. Uh, if you are really feeling like that's too much because of what we're going to get in pilot and what we're going to get in current use, we probably could back off a little bit, but just like we talked about last year, every time you roll the tax rate back, eventually you have to catch up to where you were before and that puts pressure on, on the next year. So I think 52 cents for the municipal is a reasonable compromise. It's only, uh, you know, it's not a full penny down from what we need. We need 52.497, so you're only rounding down about a half a cent, really. It's, it's a full penny from what we told the voters it was going to be, but we need 52.497. Uh, with this grant list, and as I said, that grant list is probably a little bit higher than it ultimately will be. Okay. Board discussion on the recommendation? I have no problem with Bill's. I think Bill's recommendation is spot on. The only question I really have is I assume this would be for an August and November tax, tax collection. Right. Yeah, so we will, uh, if th whatever gets approved tonight, uh, Karen Petrovich, the tax billing clerk, is planning to the run right the tax out. bills, uh, get all the, everything ready to go, and the tax bills will be going out next week, I think. Next week, yeah. They'll, they'll uh, sign them up to be printed Thursday into next week. I did include on here, by the way, uh, so the veterans exemption over $10,000, that's something that we have had for a number of years now, probably 10 years. And that adds you know, a fraction of a penny, 0 0.0018 cents to the tax rate. Uh, basically there's $13,000, $13,000, $14,000 that we're, we're giving away to the veterans there. Uh, the Hunger Mountain Child Care Center that's at the bottom of the page there. So the, the um, settlement that we made with them on their tax uh, assessment appeal last year <coughs> just so happens it's going to cost that same amount as the veterans exemption. So it's 0 .0018 for that one as well. So those two things will be added into the, into the total, um, total tax rate. Bill, could you just refresh my memory? Is the veterans exemption for all veterans, period? <coughs> disabled veterans. Okay. So if you're a disabled veteran, and I forget what the disability percentage is, but if you qualify, uh, state, law, state law exempts the first $10,000 of property value from property taxation. That's mm -hmm. across the state. Um, Waterbury has agreed to do it uh, up to I think forty thousand. So the above ten okay. is we have to pay for that on the school tax side. 
That's why I thought it was for disabled veterans, not all veterans. Yeah, it's disabled veterans. Katie, any comments? Um, I'm okay with it. I'm just wondering if, if Chris or Danny would have any questions about this. They might, yeah. but they're not here. I know. Right. And it has to be said yeah. to right. do it. I'm good with it. <laughs> we, we have a... <laughs> We have a letter going out to people that, that needs to go out. Yeah. <laughs> we and, can't you know, wait. They, whether they read the or not, they got all they, the same. They could have made a nobody reached out to. They could have made a, over. a comment by email or something right. to the chair. Yeah, typically, yeah, if it was that important to them, they would have reached out and said concern. But it seems like the recommendation Bill made, they're in support of. Um, yeah, I'm fine with it. I think it makes sense. I'll take a motion. I make a motion to uh, set the town tax rate at, at 52 cents um, for the uh, coming fiscal year. Second. And add the veterans and oh, we have, okay. uh, Mellon Child Care. Um, and there will be a, a veterans exemption of point zero zero one. Eight for veterans and point zero zero one eight for the Hunger Mountain Child Care Center. Carl and I will decide the way. Straighten out the word. <laughs> Are you good with the yeah, changes? Yeah. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Um, it's nine oh six. We had till 10. I didn't know if we wanted to move any of these topics up for a quick discussion. I know that there was a comment. I, I know, but that's why it's there. <laughs> can I add something to that? Like, yeah, I, I think if you want to add things, we can add it either in the meeting or out of it. Um, just a reminder that that even exists there, that little falling ground. Um, I would you like do to. That if you didn't add, add it to the agenda. I'm not saying we add it and right. discuss it. I'm just saying to add it. Um, I think that's what you're asking, right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Add for future discussion yeah. discussion um, what would you like to add just like an update on the senior center I mean, haven't heard from that gentleman and what their position is and if they're programming and we talked about possibly a donation bump last year so okay yeah it's a good idea and then I would like to add to that conversation surrounding Hope Davy and the disc golf. disc golf recreation area I think that that's coming to a head and the select board needs to get involved I'm going to that next recreation meeting that's taking place at Hope Davy. If you'd like to go. As when well. is that? I believe it's the seventh, seventeenth. I'm not really sure. What day? Actually, it's the fourteenth. I'm out of town, unfortunately. Um, but yes, I think I think that needs we need to be involved in that. We and we can talk more offline individually on that. Um, one thing that maybe we could talk about really quickly is that noise, noise ordinance in the downtown, just because this meeting was full of a bunch of agenda items with, so I don't know, I guess my biggest question on the noise ordinance discussion is that do we have anyone, how, how did noise complaints come in and right now, who is the authority, who, is it the state police are we asking to try to? Because right now it seems like that's the biggest problem with something like that is we don't really have. Well, that's the biggest problem we have with parking all, all of our ordinances yep. is is how do, how do we enforce them? Um, oh, I asked for it to be on the agenda as well as my neighbor, um, who is not here. But uh, this these these areas and so when it is in this like this area of the agenda that is it is available for discussion lot. because we, we are warning it so we can discuss it um yeah i know you're 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 going to be at these meetings because orca is now making his film so if you're okay with us putting on the next agenda i'm happy to do it or we could quickly try to have a discussion now but if you want to involve your neighbor and have it more on an agenda item um i just wanted you to know that we're aware of your concerns and I think it, it warrants discussion as we enter some of, the, especially with some of these I events would, going on down. I would like the whole board to be here. Well, we can never guarantee that. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. Um, 
Usually they are. But yeah, usually we have more than three. Yeah, it's just between <coughs> very loud parties and fireworks. And they happen, which makes it even more difficult, over the weekends when there is no police coverage. And the police, the state police won't cover it anyway. We have police coverage on the weekends. For, well, I mean, you, you on Saturday know. during the day, Sunday, but it, it's, it doesn't matter whether it's on a weekend or a weeknight, the state police don't generally, they're not going to go out and enforce, they're not going to write tickets. If you call them, because I've had experience, I mean, I had a next door neighbor last year that, you know, it's an Airbnb and the people there were unruly and they were outside and they were yelling at each other and it was one o'clock in the morning and, you know, I called the police and they came. Um, so they'll come if you're complaining about a, an event that's happening right now, but they're not going to enforce the local ordinance. Okay, so we'll throw it on a full agenda item in the future. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. All right. Um, unless there's anything else, I will take a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Great. Any further discussion? <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.